All right, folks, looks like it is three o'clock. So let's get started with this next session. Um, this track is made possible by NC Cardinal and live captioning made possible by Equinox Open Library Initiative. We'd like to thank the rest of the conference sponsors for making this event possible. They include Mobius, Bibliomation, and Evergreen Indiana. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube following the conclusion of the conference. Uh, we'd like to encourage everyone for this session um, to keep your mics muted except when you are talking. Uh, this is a working group and so we do encourage your participation. Um, if there's no issues with bandwidth, you're welcome to have your camera on. Um, in general, we just ask that um, and unless you're speaking, which we do encourage you to ask questions and get involved, um, but turn off or mute your mic uh, if you're not currently talking. Um, for the, after that, I'd like to uh, introduce the presenter for this session. Um, it's Jane Sandberg from Lynn Benton Community College in Oregon. And the topic uh, for this session is Student Success Working Group. With that, I'll hand it over to Jane. Hey, thank you very much. Um, and thanks for getting this all set up. You've answered like every single possible question I could have had, Benjamin. Um, actually, is, is the volume working? Yep, sounds good. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, welcome to the Student Success Working Group. Um, I'm so glad you're here, whether you're one of our regular attendees or whether this is your first time attending the group or somewhere in between. Um, we've been meeting for a few years. Um, we are we meet quarterly um, and everybody is welcome to join our our calls. So hopefully I'll see a lot of you at our future meetings as well. Um, this is going to be an interactive discussion based meeting. Um, I won't be talking very much um, except at the beginning to get us started. Um, so I'm going to really look forward to having you um, provide the dialogue. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on chat as well, and we'll just make sure that anytime somebody puts something into chat, um, we'll also be, we'll repeat the question um, by voice um, so that that's caught for the, the YouTube um, recording that's going to be made of this conversation. Um, since this is the first interactive or more interactive um, session of this track, I do want to go over the Evergreen Code of Contact. Um, before we get started, um, just to set the tone and set the um, expectations for this conversation. And I'm just going to read the quick version today. Um, Evergreen event organizers are dedicated to providing a harassment free experience for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, age or religion. We do not tolerate harassment of event participants in any form. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any event venue, including talks. Event participants violating these rules may be sanctioned or expelled from this event without a refund at the discretion of the event organizers. Harassment includes, but is not limited to, violent threats, intimidation, or personal insults directed against another person, verbal, graphic, or written comments related to gender, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, age, or religion posting sexually explicit or violent material, stalking or following, including harassing photography or recording, sustained disruption of talks or other presentations, inappropriate physical contact or sexual attention, posting or threatening to post other people's personally identifying information, advocating for or encouraging any of the above behavior and repeated harassment of others in general. If someone asks you to stop, um, then stop. Um, Oftentimes with this group, we start out with some introductions of the whole group. Um, but since we have so many participants, I think that would take up a lot of our time. So I'd like to instead start off with our first agenda topic, which is the booking module. And Christine Burns has kindly agreed to facilitate that. All right, Christine, do you have everything you need to start, the, to start your portion? Oh, good. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yes okay. we can. You didn't, 
hear my rambling about uh, not not uh, about being scared to talk to everyone. Um, uh, so I'm Christine. I'm with the SICA, the BC Libraries cooperative um, and I wanted to just take this opportunity to talk about the booking module um, I think we've talked about it in the student success group in the past um, but as Jane mentioned there's some new people here that might not usually participate in the student success meetings um, and so I thought this would be a great time to talk about booking um, and so uh, I just have a couple things to talk about and then I think we should open up um, discussion. Uh, but so basically, um, so Evergreen has a booking module. Um, I think some people know about that and some people do not. Um, the booking module can be used to reserve cataloged or non-cataloged resources um, for a particular, uh, particular set of time. It doesn't follow your regular circulation duration rules. Um, the booking module I believe was designed by post-secondary libraries primarily to be um, used to circulate non-bibliographic items, things like laptops, projectors, meeting rooms, um, but it's also used to, to reserve cataloged items, uh, DVDs and videos, um, things that are in your collection. Um, the booking module does not have a public-facing interface. Um, so only staff can see, create, edit, and view reservations. Um, but uh, uh, as uh, recently, after some development work was done, uh, patrons can now view their own reservations in the OPAC. Um, they can't place them, which is, I, I think, desired, but they can see them. They can see the status. Um, here at SICA, we currently have uh, about five of our post-secondary libraries using the booking module. Um, and uh, we, um, we have not promoted it to our public libraries, uh, though everyone does have access to it. Um, up until recently, uh, the booking module has not really had a lot of development work done to it, and there was some issues. Um, recently, uh, a lot of development has been done and there are uh, less issues with booking. Um, and so maybe in the future, we'll roll it out for uh, public libraries. It's really good for things like meeting rooms and stuff, which I think would be um, popular for public libraries to be able to book. Um, there are some challenges. Um, there's a booking, bu booking bugs, um, which I'd like to talk about. Um, and basically, my, my goal for this meeting today, or talking about booking today, is to find out um, who else is using booking, um, find out if anyone has been interested in, book, interested in using booking, but have found that there's barriers that have prevented them from using it. Um, I'd, I'd like to find out who is interested and potentially um, use the student success group to develop an official, or like a a medium official wish list for booking. Um, yeah, and so I feel like I've been talking for an hour. Um, uh, so let's start a discussion there. Um, does anyone have any initial comments? No. Um, is there anyone on the line that is using the booking module in their library or their consortium. Hi, this uh, is CW Mars. <laughs> oh, sorry, is someone with someone? Yeah, it's, it's CW Mars, Joan at CW Mars. So we've tested it and discussed it with our libraries. Um, one thing our libraries were hoping it would be good for is the library of things, you know, where you want to um, check out a bike, but you don't want it just on any day, you want to plan for it. Yep, yep. Um, and okay, so you guys have tested it. Um, you haven't implemented using it. Uh, was there something that you found in your testing that uh, prevented it? I think the um, using it in, in, a, in your example, like a library of things um, is a really good example of why you would use the booking module. Yeah, none of the libraries wanted to pilot it um, that, you know, we shared the information we have it on our 
our test server so they could play. Um, yeah. But we were looking forward to, I think it's 3.5 where the big enhancements are, is it 3.5? Yeah, I think three, four, and and three, five. Yeah, three, four. They're introduced, and then more in three, five. Absolutely. So we did find a lot of things wrong in testing. Um, things that didn't work well, uh, and of course, libraries would like it to be uh, more accessible from the patron account in the OPAC. But I think after we upgrade to um, three, four, or three, five, we can give it another test and push to see if anyone wants to try it. Um, if uh, I'm happy to to help or um, anything, if if you have questions about the booking module, um, and I, I would be very interested in talking to you after you've upgraded and, and and looked at it again as well. Okay, sure. When we can share, you know, our list of findings with you. What release are you using it on? Uh, we are on, now on 3.5. We just upgraded. Okay. Um, over on May 18th, I believe. Hi, this is Elizabeth Thompson from Noble, and we're in exactly the same situation as CW Mars. We, we did some testing and looked at it, um, have it on our list for 3.5, um, and have both public and academic libraries that are interested in it for different reasons. Um, the the Wi-Fi hotspots is a popular topic, um, uh, but uh, also really want uh, people to be able to book things themselves. I have a question about the patrons booking um, items themselves, um, because I know just if we started using that at our library, um, I know that the, there would be a lot of concerns of how do we make sure that people don't book things for 7,000 hours and not allow other students to do it, or how do we make sure that um, students only don't book things five times a week um, and there isn't really a concept of those kinds of limits in the booking module yet. So I'm wondering, like, what would it take um, in order to get to the, the goal where patrons can place their own bookings? Uh, maybe it's a separate permission. I know we've talked with academic libraries about wanting faculty to be able to book certain things um, rather than students. Um, you know, better loan rules, permissions, those kinds of things, but, but uh, um, or it's, a, it's something that's just added to particular patrons. I'm a registered booker, um, but, uh, you know, really wanting, um, basically people are booking things like rooms using other software, the same kind of software that does um, museum passes and that kind of stuff, so. Um, that's that's what they why they're seeing it this way. Um, now, um, so I, I didn't I definitely didn't want to take up too much time with booking, especially because there's uh, it's not very widely used. But I did um, include a link to a, a list of our booking bugs or the bugs or the, the bugs that are related to booking, I've put them on a spreadsheet um, and I've added a link in the student success working group agenda there um, so that uh, you can see them. Um, again, like I said, I didn't want to take up too much time, but if there was other questions or things, uh, we could continue to talk about it, but I know that everyone really wants to talk about the um, all the, the new stuff, the closures and um, things that have happened due to COVID. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm okay to move on if there's nothing else. Thank you, Christine. Um, do you want to look at the list of booking bugs really quickly together? Uh, we uh, we could. Um, do you want to pull it up on your screen? Um, the other thing I have, uh, if what well, again, I um, I had. If you wanted to, I could share my screen. Uh, it, it's oh, you have it there. You let's look at your screen. Okay. 
And I just wanted to let you all know in chat, Jennifer Pringle said it might also be useful to be able to set based on resource type, whether or not patrons can book it. Right. That would, yeah, like, so if, if it was a meeting room or something, patrons could book it themselves, but potentially like uh, DVD resources or catalog things could not be booked by patrons. Um, okay, so so one of the big things uh, with booking is uh, that there is no link uh, with circulation. Um, so as I mentioned, booking can be used for cataloged items and non-cataloged items. Um, it works really well if you're doing all non-cataloged items, um, but when you start trying to use both non-cataloged and cataloged items, you'll find that there's no um, link to circulation for the cataloged items. Um, there's been quite a bit of discussion over the years on this, and it seems like it's quite a complex um, issue. Uh, there's been some good ideas about how to just easily create a reference between those two tables. Um, but a lot of the sort of wish list things that we've come up with are dependent on a link between booking resources and circulation. I think it's asset.copy. Um, it's in that launch pad, that very first one, the 1085263. Um, there's also in booking um, the ability to assign attributes to your resources and then limit your available resources by those attributes. And those things have never, aren't really working very well. It's pretty buggy. Um, there is a, a, a wish list request, uh, 1830262. Um, James Forney has suggested a way to uh, sort of reimagine the cr resource creation process so that the attributes are included in the resource um, table as opposed to separate tables. Um, so, so a couple of those bugs are dependent on one another. Uh, and, re and it requires some like high level thinking of how we want it to work, um, I think. Um, the big ones for us right now um, are that uh, it's currently possible to create duplicate bookings or to reserve an item twice. Um, and so that's causing like immediate- I just really can't follow this one too much. I'm leaving it on because you have um, I'm muted. Um, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, so, so, so you can see uh, that you know there's there's quite a list here. Um, I I don't think we want to go through all of them. Um, I've included a couple that are not booking specific. Um, like here, the OPAC better handling of date and time formats. Um, because they they are very related to the use of booking. Um, so this one, uh, as I mentioned before, patrons can view their reservations in the OPAC, uh, but because of this date format issue, they see um, the the time twice. Um, for the Sitka libraries, the post secondaries do hourly loans, and so we've set it up so that the OPAC can display the due time. Um, and, and those two features are sort of conflicting with one another. Um, and, and so there's some good comments in this bug, again, around um, better uh, handling of date and time formats that is not just specifically to uh, booking related. Um, does anyone have any questions? James, sorry, did, did, was there anyone that, anything specifically that you wanted me to discuss? I think this has been great, Christine. Um, I, why don't we leave it open for another minute just for somebody, anybody else who has a question and then we can move on to the next topic. I just want to mention if anybody's interested, um, Christine actually put together several videos um, for our libraries that look at booking in 3.5. Um, so if anybody's wanting to take a look and see 
what it looks like, at least in our system, um, those are publicly available on our YouTube channel. Those videos sound helpful. I see there's something in the chat. Oh, and it's all the videos. Thanks so much, Jennifer, for posting those. All right. Um, thanks again, Christine. I think we'll move on to the next topic now, um, thank which, thank you, um, which is um, COVID-19, definitely on everybody's minds. Um, Eva Tsernanyakova um, kindly um, agreed to provide an introduction um, to this topic. So Eva, could you please introduce? Yes, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name we is... Can. <laughs> My name is Eva Cerniakova. Uh, greetings from the Czech Republic. Uh, I, uh, I work in Jabok Library in Prague. And uh, when we were planning the, uh, the agenda for this meeting, Jane was asking about, about the topics. And she was afraid that we are all tired of uh, COVID-19 topic. But uh, for me, it's uh, quite interesting because uh, maybe uh, there's a quite similar situation in the Czech Republic or was a similar situation in the Czech Republic as it is or as it was as it was in, in the United States or in Canada or worldwide. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, quite a big challenge because the closing of libraries in the Czech Republic and I suppose in the United States and Canada too uh, came uh, overnight. Uh, it was uh, very instant and we, uh, uh, we have to think what to do and there were a lot of challenges. Uh, some of them uh, uh, were all, all already mentioned in, uh, in the uh, introduction uh, uh, in the opening of the conference. Uh, it was, for example, uh, renew items or uh, renewing uh, uh, Patron account expiration, which was excellent uh, because we could use uh, the, the feature of uh, emergency closing. It was so smooth. So it was really good. And thank you very much. Uh, thanks, for, thanks to all who have uh, working on it because it was very useful. Uh, in our library, we, uh, we felt that we want to uh, uh, send book by email because we have a lot of students that uh, uh, need to continue uh, their studies, uh, they need to uh, uh, write their essays and things like that. So we decided we will send them book. They will uh, they they would order the book uh, by uh, catalog. But then we have to solve some problem connected with this uh, with this because we had to. Uh, um, uh, this distinguish whether students uh, have placed uh, hold and want to uh, take uh, uh, take the book after the quarantine have finished, or whether uh, he or she wants to send the book by email. And the problem was also that some students uh, uh, have uh, um, um, stayed. Uh, at uh, at parents or on any other place uh, and it was added that they didn't have in the evergreen account so uh, this was something what they have to do uh, we missed uh, we missed uh, some option to order um, sending books by post by uh, um, placing the hold, uh, but uh, then we decided to uh, to incorporate it, uh, some form to uh, uh, place hold uh, results page and uh, students can add uh, optional address and so on. So uh, we decided to, to do it like this. Uh, I think I won't speak uh, uh, longer because I would like to hear about uh, uh, experiences uh, of uh, uh, librarians uh, uh, overseas and I would like to hear what uh, challenges you uh, had to uh, 
to face and uh, how did you solve issues uh, that uh, was brought by this uh, COVID-19 situation? Thank you for your sharing. Thank you for that really great introduction. Um, if I know everybody has a lot to say about this topic, so could you please unmute yourself and let us know how you in your library um, responded to COVID-19? I'll just say that the emergency closing option, I don't know what we would have done without it. Um, or at least it would have, there would have been a lot more work on our end versus the libraries um, as everybody had to close. We, uh, at Sitka, we also turned on the feature for patron self-registration, and that seemed to be quite popular um, amongst the Sitka libraries. Uh, I think when, uh, during the introduction this morning, um, talking about the community outreach piece, um, I, think, I believe it was Karen listed off all of the things that we did um, when she was saying um, patron self-check, emergency closure, um, turning off hold notices. Um, as she was going through the list, I said, check, check, check. Those are all things that we did. Um, within SICA, we have a variety of different kinds of libraries, and they all sort of did those things in different ways. Um, some turned holds on, some um, are, are not doing any holds at all. Um, it's been very interesting to see the the variations amongst the libraries and it's been great to see how well Evergreen has handled the situation. As Jennifer said, it's made our lives um, easier. I and, would, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I would echo that. You know, we at NC Cardinal, we kind of found that after the first week or so, we kind of um, figured out our sort of playbook of sort of things that we could do for library systems. Of course, we started off with the emergency closing editors. And um, one of the things that we learned is it works better to do that on a branch level rather than a system level. Um, when we tried it for some of our big systems, it would not actually complete the process of bumping forward, you know, all the holds and search dates and that sort of thing. Um, I'll post a link to uh, a website or a web page, shall I say, that we um, ended up putting together um, and we ended up sort of sending out a message to everybody that said, you know, here's the list of things that we can do for you in terms of hard boundaries, turning on or turning off um, email notices, changing the notices, updating patron accounts, um, some of that kind of stuff. So it was a, um, um, you know, kind of a, we, we learned over time sort of what the different things were and then sent on message to everybody and said, you know, here's sort of our suite of options that you know maybe we can help you with and let us know what you want to do set up a survey and they could you know respond to each one of the things and say yes i want to bump my due dates forward uh, i want to stop charging fines all that kind of stuff one thing that our library did that was a bit challenging in Evergreen. Um, so we stopped charging fines while we were closed, um, but we also wanted to forgive all the existing fines, even those that had accrued before any COVID-19 closures, um, with the understanding that our patrons were going to be facing some economic hardships and we didn't want to be adding our library fines to those. Um, and Jason Stevenson was gave me a script that got me half of the way there, but it was still like a uh, like multiple day process trying to figure out how to just go ahead and clear out those fines. Yeah. 
we found other... that a lot of our libraries are going fine free going forward. So we've had to update a, a, a lot of circulation policies um, as well. I was very interested in hearing about uh, someone who, whoever it was that created, uh, used age protect to block all holds for 100 years. Uh, I have a sticky note here to follow up and think about that some more for future. It was, it, it, Seems like it was a lot less work to do it that way than what we did uh, adjusting policies for so many different libraries. And we're now having a lot of our libraries ask for their circulation policies to be updated, not just around fines, um, but most, or not most, several libraries are um, wanting to extend all their loan periods by a week. Um, in some cases, just to give their patrons more time and in other cases because they are uh, checking out the items as part of processing them for curbside um, and so they want to give an extra week because that may be um, uh, some of that loan period may be taken up um, by the time it takes the patron to come in and actually pick up their items. One of the other things that we found is that as library systems, you know, we're, we have a consortium and, and so not everybody started resource sharing at the same time. So we had to have a way to help people figure out um, which items on their pick lists were for, item, were for libraries that were actually resource sharing. So we um, had to put together a sort of VLOOKUP in Excel to be able to let libraries paste their um, pick list and then compare that, uh, the pickup library against the list of pickup libraries that were open and receiving materials so that they knew which materials to actually pick. One thing that we found ourselves doing was um, we wound up distributing a lot of laptops, both from our own collection, but then also from all the other departments across campus that had some spare laptops lying around that could be used by students. Um, and our librarians would just like drive across our counties, um, delivering them to, to people's doorsteps. Um, and actually cataloging those and processing those even though we were doing pretty minimal cataloging and processing still took up a bunch of time because you still have to make your mark record for this weird laptop that you found in somebody's office uh, we haven't had any uh, tickets come into us on the consortium level but i've seen um through social media that a bunch of our post-secondaries are loaning out laptops to students who otherwise uh, wouldn't have access. So I think that's um, probably happening across a lot of libraries right now. Has anybody had a chance to look at the curbside pickup feature that is being proposed for Evergreen? Uh, at Sitka, we've looked at the specs, um, but we haven't looked at anything uh, demo-wise yet. Um, we already have one um, post-secondary that emailed to ask when we were implementing it. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about what it's uh, um, intended to do and how it's intended to work? Um, I don't really know much about it, so maybe somebody else would be a better person for that. I know it's supposed to interact and like 
touch as little existing infrastructure as possible. It's supposed to be like on the side so people can use it or don't have to use it. It's not going to visually affect people that choose to not use it. Um, that was the one major thing that I remembered from reading the specs. And I think that's also in part so that um, hopefully libraries can implement it without having to do any major upgrading. I just posted a link to the Launchpad bug that has some of the information about it into our chat. Um, and I just posted the um, highlight from Equinox um, that talks a little bit about it that they posted at the beginning of the month announcing it. We had a conversation earlier this afternoon when I was not actually in this conference, but in a meeting for Evergreen Indiana, they're looking at, um, they had been looking at another uh, curbside, um, well, it was an app that had a curb, curbside module built into it. And when they looked at the mock-ups that are included in the specifications there, they were impressed and said that they, they look, um, at least the workflows look similar and they're understandable for, for those things that they're wanting to implement in the public library setting. Now, how that translates to an academic setting is going to, of course, be a little bit different, but. So far, I'd say we haven't really had much difference in a lot of the requests that we've had um, for support through this between the different types of libraries that we have because uh, I think as Christine said um, we have public post-secondary special we have you know k-12 mix of, of everything in Sitka um, but I wouldn't be surprised if as we head towards September um, there's going to be specific things that our different library types are looking at, um, especially around post-secondaries and the potential to have to be doing a lot more um, mailing uh, of items. And I should probably include it as part of that, that uh, most, I think, potentially all libraries and, or sorry, all post-secondaries in British Columbia have already announced that um, September is going to be almost purely online semesters for them. Look at you guys being proactive in things. Are any of your academic libraries um, for other folks on the call um, going to be open this fall? Okay, I'm not hearing any responses there. 
Um, one more question, um, and then I think we can move on to the next topic. Um, I'm really interested to know like what things you've started doing um, during COVID-19 that you plan to take forward even after the, the quarantine and the, the pandemic are, are over or more over. We, we have decided uh, to uh, continue sending books by post because we think uh, this could be very useful for uh, our distant program students uh, or for people that are that have some uh, some uh, health problems or for students with uh, with special needs and so on so um, we have invented the, uh, how to do it uh, and now we will continue we would never think about it i think without COVID. so at least something good one thing i think that we're planning to keep is um, the option for libraries to have the patron self-registration because um, that's not a feature we had used in Evergreen um, for any of our libraries previously. Um, and that'll be something that libraries can now uh, choose whether they want to use. Yeah, our libraries have been using it in some, and it's an opt-in by library. Um, with, the, with the current situation, um, people are wishing there was an option to make the to create a card that people can to create a record so that people could start using it um, before without waiting for staff to come through and and uh, do some processing on those um, so that they can get into the electronic resources. We've heard that too. We've had libraries come from TLC and it, that is a feature available in TLC. So we have heard that as well. And a, a number of our libraries who didn't previously make much use of uh, the self registration option are, are using it now to allow uh, patrons to have access to the electronic resources. And I expect that at least some of them will continue to do that. Uh, one thing that possibly we just haven't had the time to investigate far enough into, but um, does anybody know if it's possible to get stats on pending patrons? Like how many were created? Because that's not something we've found yet. Um, there doesn't appear to be a way to tell if a patron account, once it's um, fully created, originated as a pending um, self-registration. Yeah, I don't think we have any statistics on that. The way our libraries are using it currently is the patron fills something out, the staff um, then creates the record, um, seeing if the patron already has a card, which is often the case, um, and emails the information to the patron and it has a short, um, a permission group that expires in, right now it's two months, but it's normally even shorter than that, um, so that the patron has to come in and, um, present their identification. So it's really, it's, it's policy um, more than, than technology that is um, making this a more cumbersome process for uh, patrons who just want to use the electronic resources, but would like to streamline that more. Well, and I was very <clears throat> intrigued by, I think what 
Andrea said during the opening remarks about um, a, a library or a consortium who figured out how to get the barcode into the welcome email. There is definitely a lot of really interesting stuff going on. Um, I'm going to cut this discussion short um, and quickly move to the last topic on the agenda, um, which is the course reserves module or the course materials module. Um, and this is a project that Noble, Treasure Valley Community College, and Lynn Benton Community College have been working together on. It's um, started out really fast and we got a lot of really great stuff working and then COVID-19 hit and now things are going a lot slower, um, but uh, fortunately it, it's, it's starting to pick back up again. Um, I wanted to give you a quick little pre-recorded demo of what um, that is looking like right now. Um, and so I'll just start sharing my screen again. Um, so one thing that we really wanted was you don't have to do like 500,000 different settings just to get started, just to try it out. Um, that's one of the things about the acquisitions module, for example, you have to do like all these different settings before you can even start using it. Um, for this course materials module, um, you just go to the library settings editor, go to course and set that to true. Um, and you can set it um, for just specific libraries in your consortium, or you can opt in a whole system or a whole consortium to using it. Um, what this does is it gives you access to this course list, um, which is just under local administration. Um, and you can go ahead and edit existing courses, you can archive them, and then you can add your materials to the course. Um, and uh, here's a, just an example of throwing a barcode on there and you can say whether it's required, optional, what have you. Um, you can set temporary um, uh, call numbers, circulation modifier, item status, shelving locations um, that will, that will um, appear and and be effective once while the, while the item is on reserves. Um, and then as soon as the item is off reserves or the course ends, um, it will return to the original circulation modifier, original call number, et cetera. Um, you can also see that here in the, in the OPAC, it does display which course or courses uh, a particular item is attached to. Um, so one other thing is we want this to go beyond a traditional course re reserves module um, because we want to be able to incorporate library ebooks and open educational resources, those things that we know are saving students money, um, but are not necessarily in our catalogs ready to go and definitely don't have a barcode attached to them. Um, so one of the things that Catalyte, who's doing the development for this, is currently working on is um, getting those non-cataloged items um, so that you can add them to courses. I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Um, it allows patrons to go to the OPAC and search by the instructor, their course number, their course title. Um, I think a lot of us who have done public services will know about those students who say, I need the textbook for my class, um, but I don't really remember the name of my professor or the name of the course or the number of the course. So as long as you have at least some of that information, the search function will be able to help out. There's also going to be a browse function for those students who really don't know any of that information and just need to browse all the biology courses. Um, it's 
um, going to be integrated both into the classic OPAC and the new staff catalog. And I will fast forward a little bit here. And I think that's all I have to say in that demo. Um, what questions do you have really quickly? That looks amazing, Jane. I, can I just jump in here? This is Elizabeth from Noble again. Um, we were really excited about this. We have a long history of using course reserves with our previous system. And when we moved to Evergreen, we started using the syrup course reserves thing, which was sort of a, we're still using it. It's sort of a not, it's another open source thing that was sort of bolted on to, to uh, uh, rather awkwardly bolted on to Evergreen. Um, and we'd, we'd been reasonably happy with that, but, um, but nobody else is really using it. And so the, the development for that is not going anywhere and it's not truly integrated in, into Evergreen. So we were really happy um, when, we, when we saw what um, Jane's institution and uh, also uh, Treasure Valley, am I getting that right? Um, That's correct. Uh, we're doing. Um, so we jumped in just to, to uh, um, with some funding for the electronic resources. Um, prescient, since, since now, of course, that's, that's mostly what everybody may be using for a while. Um, the the uh, other things we see in the future, we're, we're really happy that this is happening because now we have a course reserves module um, within Evergreen that then can be um, improved and, and uh, added to and developed. Um, so we want to add things like terms, fall term, spring term, um, academic departments. Right now it's just courses and we would like a little more structure than that. Um, we have a lot of ideas about being able to batch add items to a course um, with a file of barcodes and um, more course management, copy one course to another course and archive and unarchive things and um, be able to associate a group of patrons with a course, a group of students with a course so that um, that allows them to, to get to electronic resources or other things based on their uh, membership in the, in the course. So we see a lot of, of uh, future development for this, um, but we're, so, we're just so glad that we now have a long list of development for a new, truly integrated with with Evergreen um, course reserves thing that will, you know, that will, uh, we hope develop in all the ways we want it to. I keep thinking course reserves is going to be over someday um, with electronic resources and other things, but that that is not the case for our institutions um, anytime soon. Thank you for saying that, Elizabeth. I think we had better start to clear out and um, make sure that we have a break before the next session, um, which is coming up in seven minutes. So I'm going to call us done for now. Um, but thank you so much for attending the Student Success Working Group. Um, I, it was a really great conversation. I learned a bunch of things. I hope you did too. Um, and we meet quarterly. So be on the lookout for some emails about our next meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jane.